بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم انا الدكتور احمد شوقي استاذ مساعد القلب جامعه عين شمس اند النهارده هنتكلم عن الليت مانجمنت اوف مايوكارديال انفاركشن وات ار وي انتندد ليرنينج اوتكمز هاو تو ستراتيفاي اور بيشنتس هو سرفايفد ذا اكيوت فيس اوف ان اكيوت كورنيس سيندروم اوتلايننج المانجمنت هاو وي ار جوين تو تريت ايتش بيشنت كل مريض مين اللي محتاج او انديكيشنز اوف كورونري ريفاسكولاريزيشنز وات ار ذا كومبوننتس اوف ذا سيكندري بريفنشن ذا بروجنوزيس سرفايفل اند ديث ريتس اوف ان اكيوت كورونيس سيندروم اند مانجمنت اوف ان اكيوت كورونيس سيندروم ان ذا اولدر ايج جروبس وات ار ذا كومبوننتس عندنا كذا كومبوننت طبعا الريسك ستراتيفيكيشن اوف ذيس بيشنت افتر ذا فيرست 12 اورز اند وات فيرذر انفستيجيشنز دو وي ريكواير lifestyle modification how to induce secondary prevention using drugs rehabilitation and devices that are required later on risk stratification has so many different ways and methods and it's important to understand the risk of each patient thus changing the management strategy in each patient those with very high risk require immediate coronary Uh, angiography and angioplasty if possible those with high risk criteria need that but in the first 24 hours intermediate risk patients can do it within the hospital and low risk patients do not require this at all in some patients they can have further investigations من الحاجات المهمة أوي في very high risk criteria is the unstable patient whether unstable hemodynamically like shock or recurrent or ongoing chest pain, very unstable arrhythmias or life-threatening arrhythmias, low mechanical complications or acute heart failure. But this is really important. A high-risk criterion can be used by just a rise and fall in cardiac troponin, meshia, ma il waveform of a myocardial infarction, changes in the ST, dynamic changes, not just ST segment depression persistent, the limon can tassel for left ventricular hypertrophy, And a score system for the risk of the patient, it's very well known, it's called the GRACE risk score. Other risks as diabetes, renal insufficiency, impaired left ventricular function, systolic function are all intermediate criteria. So here, risk stratification is extremely important. Then we go into the lifestyle and risk factor modification. One of the most important causes of acute coronary syndromes in the young, especially the young males, is smoking. And giving up smoking is effective in reducing these events, which is extremely important. One of the most under-prescribed uh, medications are the statins, as to say hyperlipidemia. Statins are not only LDL reduction strategy, but also they reduce death, reinfarction, in the myocardium or even a stroke because of not only their lipid lowering but also of their pleiotropic effect decreasing inflammation decreasing platelet aggregability and other problems that occur during the acute syndromes and these patients should receive a very high dose statins and the high dose statins that are known are the atorvastatin 40 to 80 milligrams or the rosuvastatin 20 milligrams not only are they more powerful in LDR reduction but they also reduce death and reinfarction and stroke better than their comparator lower doses other risk factors like maintaining an ideal body weight is very important eating a low fat diet healthy as the mediterranean diet also helps regular exercise and very good control of hypertension and other risk factors one of the most important is diabetes mellitus which is prevalent in nearly one third of patients presenting with acute coronary syndrome so this is very important that we should modify other risk factors as well can patients really go back to life very quickly or very uh, soon this is important that we should understand what happened to the patient we know acute coronary syndrome can range from an unstable angina to an st elevation mi and as we know 
an ST elevation MI has more necrotic muscle than an unstable angina. And this necrotic muscle takes a month or a, a month and a half to re be replaced with fibrous tissue in most cases. But let's say if we have no complications, on the second day he can move easily within the uh, coronary care unit or the ward and return home in less than a week. But it's important to emphasize that activity here is very important so he can return to work very quickly within this month month and a half even shorter periods of time if the uh, damage to the myocardium was not big also one of the most important problems that we face in those with an acute coronary syndrome is depression emotional problems and depression are very important and they should be addressed not all of them require medications but just talking to the patients or even psychotherapy not by a psychotherapist in most cases by the physician himself or herself can help these patients rehabilitate quicker and rehabilitation programs in the past few years have shown incredible wealth and incredible uh, protocols that improved not only the quality of life of patients but reduced their subsequent events and problems that occur later on how about the secondary prevention of drug therapy they are very important. We talked about statins definitely from the acute phase, but here aspirin and the P2Y12 inhibitors on the surface of the platelets are extremely important. Aspirin is important in a low dose. The new recommendations that occurred this year say 100 milligrams and lower, not so much with the higher doses of aspirin are required. Two main drugs are being given now for prevention as a P2Y12 inhibitors. It's either ticagrelor or clopidogrel. And in an acute coronary syndrome, whether it's unstable angina, non-ST elevation MI or ST elevation MI, it should be given in a combination with aspirin for at least 12 months. Why 12 months? Because this is the period in which a recurrent event is very high not only because of the hypercoagulability of the body state, but also of the other problems that occur with inflammation. Beta blockers are important in ischemic heart disease. They decrease the heart rate and the myocardial oxygen consumption, thus improving symptoms. They are very important, certain beta blockers in heart failure patients. So beta blockers here are really important for prevention of further events. If you have an impaired ejection fraction, of course, we know the ACE inhibitors are a cornerstone. And also, in smaller doses, even if the left ventricular is not in failure, they counteract ventricular remodeling and help avoid ventricular failure. And this is really important of the left ventricle. Another cornerstone which is not really addressed enough in patients with an impaired ejection fraction especially in an acute MI, are the mineralocorticoid antagonists, mainly epilerinone and also spironolactone, which are really important, especially in those with an impaired ejection fraction. Thus, they improve survival and symptomatology as well. And this is just a summary of how medical treatment is really important. We know ACE inhibitors are recommended. Of course, if you have an intolerant patient to ACE, you can give a ARB or an angiotensin receptor blocker. Beta blocker is important and MRA. This is important in certain cases in which we have an impaired ejection fraction. And most acute coronary syndromes, especially with the ST elevation myocardial infarction, especially in the patients that have an anterior infarction, will have an impaired ejection fraction. Beta blockers are really important, but not all of them. These are the four beta blockers that have been addressed in impaired ejection fraction, not any other beta blockers. So here we can see what is important. And medical treatment in those with an impaired ejection fraction, especially with the ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and mineralocorticoid antagonists, reduce mortality and improve patients' lives. This is really important. Again, we should remember that this algorithm is really important. We have two big problems in ischemic patients. The angina relief, which is related to the beta blockers. We can add calcium antagonists if we have problems with the beta blockers or contraindications. 
and other drugs like short acting nitrates, long acting nitrates, ibuprofen. If we have a heart rate that is not controlled and the blood pressure is low, we can have other metabolic effect drugs like trimetazidin or ranolazin, or calcium modulators that like nicorandel. And event prevention, which is the most important. Aspirin here is a cornerstone. Aspirin is not a cornerstone in primary prevention in ischemia, but is important in secondary prevention. On the contrary, statins are very important in primary and secondary prevention. And again, in an acute chronic syndrome, I remind you, statins should be given in the higher dose. Of course, you can consider ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, if, especially if, the patient has a reduced ejection fraction. But if he doesn't, sometimes you can give small dose of ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers if he or she are ACE intolerant to avoid ventricular remodeling. Device therapy, that is to say survivors of this acute coronary syndrome, may require something called an implantable cardiac defibrillator, or as patient people in the electrophysiology department call them, ICDs. They prevent sudden cardiac death in those with severe left ventricular impairment after a myocardial infarction, and even they improve and prevent sudden cardiac death in those with severe left ventricular impairment without a myocardial infarction, and they have been upgraded in the recent guidelines. So here, they are really important if the patient has uh, certain criteria to be fulfilled. If the patient also has a wide QRS complex with a reduced ejection fraction and non-improvement on medical therapy for his heart failure post a myocardial infarction or even not a myocardial infarction, cardiac resynchronization, uh, that is to say, resynchronization of the contractility of the left ventricle here is really important. And of course, sometimes we can put both devices in a single battery to gain more benefit for the patients. How about the prognosis? This is the number one killer in the world. And nearly a quarter, I remind you, a quarter of patients can die within a few minutes without medical care. And this is in the best societies with the best medical care and with the best response teams to go and get the patient. This has dropped dramatically due to patient education and improved ambulances. And I, I will say that one quarter of cases is a marked improvement because a few years back it was nearly 40%. Half of the deaths that occur, occur in the first 24 hours. It's a killer. And those with unstable mortality, uh, those with unstable angina, I'm sorry, have a mortality half that of myocardial infarction. Better prognosis. But Early death is always due to an arrhythmia. We should w always keep our patients on a monitor. That's important. And later on, of course, the mortality is there. That's why giving aspirin, giving P2Y12 inhibitors, giving high-dose statins are really important to reduce death. We're not talking about symptoms only. We're talking about death. How about myocardial infarction in the older age? Of course, with the older age, they're more friable fragile, frail, and there's a lot of different presentations. We remind you their sensation of pain is really distorted. Sometimes it's just fatigue, anorexia, generalized weakness, but if a patient in the older age groups gets a myocardial infarction, the mortality rate rises very steeply. And of course, as we said before, the survival depends on early management, risk stratification, and prompt medical therapy, which is very important. Of course, take into consideration that if you give an antiplatelet in these older ages, you should always be aware of their higher risk of complications, whether it's bleeding, of course, they don't probably have problems with their kidneys or liver function tests, so drug toxicity here is higher. And even in newer guidelines in dyslipidemia management, just reduce the dose of statins to half that of the actual one we're giving when we have a patient that's above 70 or 75. Hazards of treatment are very important in old age. So to wrap up, risk stratification is extremely important.
This leads to the correct management that improves survival. Not all patients need coronary vascularizations. Very high risk immediately, high risk within the first 24 hours, intermediate risk within the hospital stay, and low risk, we can do substantial investigations to assess their risk. Secondary prevention is a cornerstone in the late management of acute coronary syndromes. Why? Because this is the number one killer all over the world and carries a very poor prognosis. Actually, if you look at long-term data, after 20 years of an acute coronary syndrome, 75% of patients are probably going to be dead. Older patients that have an acute coronary syndrome should be managed, not to be left. They have a high risk, but always careful management because they are more liable to complications from the disease and from the medications. And thank you so much.